Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 2017 Covey Lecture Series. Uh, we're excited to have this opportunity to help share research uh, on topics spanning the entire grape and wine value chain over the course of this lecture series. So we've been running the series for a number of years now and it continues to grow every year. So we have another exciting lineup for 2017. And today we're really proud and really happy to present uh, Covey professional affiliate uh, Kevin Usher, Dr. Kevin Usher, a senior scientist at Agriculture Agri-Food Canada at the Summerland Research and Development Centre in British Columbia. His research is focused on how site conditions and management practices influence grape and wine quality. Kevin's a phytochemist, so that's a really powerful, uh, being a phytochemist, it's very powerful, uh, uh, what do I want to say here? <laughs> tool, like to have a phytochemist on your, on your staff to help work on the development of flavor, aroma, mouthfeel, and pigments in grape and wine. Currently, he is mostly working on canopy management strategies to improve red and wine grape varieties, and with nitrogen application rate, timing, and frequency to determine the impacts on methoxyperazine development. He's also involved in, an, in collaborator on a number of other projects uh, that evaluate quality in relation to water relations, cover crops, cluster positioning, virus infection, sustainability and mechanization. So again, working with all the other scientists at, uh, at Summerland. He's also an, uh, Kevin's also an active member of the Research and Development and Conference Subcommittee of the BC Wine and Grape Council, or Grape and Wine Council. So with that, please uh, uh, join me in welcoming Kevin today. Thank you very much, Jim, and uh, it's really an honor to be here to talk to you guys about my research on um, basically canopy management and how that influences grape and wine quality. And um, Jim just listed off a number of things that I do, but we do a lot of that work in collaboration, and I just listed uh, a lot of my collaborators here at the bottom of my slide. And the work that I'm going to present here is really a compilation of work over about 15 years. And uh, most of these people have, well, all of these people have contributed in some way. So can, there's many, many ways of doing canopy management and uh, of sort of manipulating the canopy. And things like trellis design, uh, you can work with canopy structure within a trellis design. Uh, is pruning, there's shoot thinning, positioning, tipping, and um, leaf removal, which I'll talk a lot about today, and then uh, fruit removal and, and positioning. Um, a lot of these uh, manipulations are really uh, there to control light, temperature, and humidity within the canopy. So. Uh, when we talk about canopy sort of design and architecture, uh, we're really interested in uh, shading and the shade effect on fruit quality. That's what I'm interested in, in a big way. Um, so shade on, on fruit quality, uh, it affects things like phenolics, um, the fruity floral aromas, uh, these things are reduced. Sugar can be reduced. You can increase malic acid and disease incidence. If you have a really uh, crowded, um, dense foliage within the canopy, you, get, you can get a lot of humidity in there and disease. And then you can also have uh, herbaceous flavors and aromas develop. So if we're talking about leaf removal and open canopies, there's a lot of benefits by, by having this. Um, by opening that fruiting zone, you can change the light quality and quantity. Uh, can changes the fruit temperature in that environment. It increases air circulation. You get better spray penetration, and uh, you can hand harvest a lot quicker because you can see the fruit easier. Um, Tom Lowry, this what really kicked a lot of this off for me was a study that Tom Lowry did, and I had uh, some involvement with that where he used leaf removal at a certain stage early in the season to control leaf hoppers. So by removing leaves at, right at the perfect time when the eggs are being laid, you can reduce leaf hopper numbers by 70 or 80%. Right at the beginning of the season, it knocks them back for the rest of the season. 
And then, of course, uh, there's changes in fruit composition and quality, which I'll, I'll talk quite a bit about. So the question is, how much fruit exposure is good? Well, it really depends on what your goals are for the grapes, wine, and the methods of exposure that you're using or the methods of uh, canopy manipulation. So open canopies, they provide dapple light, and dapple light has been shown in the fruiting zone can promote uh, um, phenolic development and some flavor development as well. So this is particularly important in red varieties, and in white varieties, um, it's not as well studied in terms of some of these aroma uh, compounds, but I think I have some data here that can shed a little more light on that. Um, and so that just adds the final point there where, depending on whether it's red or white grapes, and depending on the grape variety as well, um, the optimum timing and exposure levels uh, may vary. So I'm going to go through a number of uh, uh, projects that we had, and each project had a, a number of experiments in it. And this one here really uh, started us off looking at how the environment and things like road direction and, and how grapes are presented to the sun, essentially, in light, how that influences uh, flavor and aroma in grapes. So this study, we looked at um, both Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. I'm only going to talk about Chardonnay today. And we had 40 different sites throughout the Okanagan Valley, and those are indicated by the red dots. And within each site, we had two plots and uh, one panel or five vines per plot. So basically, at each site, we had uh, 10 vines we were studying. We did this over three consecutive years. We measured many different parameters, and here's, here's a list of uh, a lot of them. Really what we were trying to do is, uh, is take some measurements and, and characterize the canopy itself and the vine and its environment, uh, some leaf quality, leaf parameters, and also look at uh, both fruit and yield components. We also looked at fruit composition, so um, we looked at uh, basic composition, uh, aroma, nitrogen in particular, and then some other ions. And for the aroma, we really focused on uh, something called norisoprenoids, and they are terpenoids. And the next few slides are about them, and they are the main aroma compounds found in Chardonnay. And uh, they're a little odd, they're uh, 13 carbon terpenoids, which normally they're, they go on sets of fives to 10, 15, 20. Um, and they're found in both a bound and a free form. So what I'm showing you here are total nares prenoids. So we've cleaved off the sugar and we're analyzing uh, the, the group as a whole. So the first, um, this first slide here is showing the year-to-year -year variation in nares prenoids. So uh, the first two years are fairly similar, and then in 2003, we see this decrease um, uh, by about 20% in these aroma compounds. And if you notice 2003, the growing degree days here were a lot higher than in the other two years, and we also had a longer season, so more frost-free days. Um, this was the year that we had major fires all over BC, uh, houses in Kelowna burnt, it was an extremely hot year. And if we look at average temperatures throughout the season, we can see there's some spikes where we have these uh, really, really hot periods. Norisoprenoid biosynthesis uh, optimum for the enzymes is between 10 and 20 degrees Celsius, so it's, it's quite a bit lower than that for uh, phenolic development. This was kind of a first indication that, that made us start wondering, is temperature playing a role? Like, is it really important to have cooler temperatures for the development of these, these compounds since we see less in this much hotter year? Then we, from this experiment, we, we started looking at road direction and aspect. And this is really, a, to me, this is a, quite an incredible find where here we have noriseprenoid content and the road direction here. 
And then yellow is an eastern aspect and a red is the western aspect. So the eastern aspect is actually on the west side of the valley. So our valley runs north-south. So if you're on the west side of the valley, you face towards the east. So that's the eastern aspect and vice versa. So if you're on the eastern side of the valley and face towards the west, it's a western aspect. So when you combine that aspect with the road direction, you can see that when you're on the east side of the valley with this western aspect, you get almost in a north-south road direction, pretty much double the amount of these aroma compounds. And it holds true. So on that uh, eastern side, for each of these road directions, we have higher levels of the, of the Nori Suprinos. We didn't have any of this road direction here on that side of the valley, that's why there's no, no uh, red peak or red uh, bar there. So that was the, the last slide. There was uh, sort of further evidence that there's something going on with how uh, the grapes and the vines are presented to the sun. And, um, and maybe they're heating differently. So in this slide, we're looking at uh, cluster exposure here and leaf removal down here. And so this is where we looked at the vines in all those 40 sites. And we uh, did both a survey and visited the sites to determine if they're doing leaf removal or not. And, and then we did visual assessments on how much cluster exposure there was when they did that leaf removal. So if they did leaf removal, uh, there was about 60% cluster exposure. And if they didn't do leaf removal, there was about 25% cluster exposure. So if we look down at the bottom graph, uh, these are different norisoprenoids. And this is their concentration on the y-axis. So when they did not do leaf removal, in each case, we had higher levels of uh, of these aroma compounds. So another indication that uh, either the amount of light or the amount that those clusters are heating up has some influence on the development of these aromas. So we thought about this uh, and came up with uh, a bit of a hypothesis why this might be happening. So this is the graph down the bottom you already saw. And this is, uh, these are vines growing on the eastern slope, so this is the western aspect. So we're talking about these red bars here. When the sun comes up in the morning, uh, these vines, and of course this is very exaggerated, we don't usually grow on that steepest slope, but uh, <laughs> we get low intensity, late morning exposure. The clusters will actually stay fairly cool until in the, after, in the sort of midday. And then they start heating up, and um, by the afternoon, they get more intense late afternoon sun, but the clusters are already, are already warm by then, and this is there's kind of a short uh, period of time where those um, clusters are hot, but then the ambient temperature starts dropping soon after that. Whereas on the west side of the valley, so these are the yellow bars, the eastern aspect, there's intense morning sun on this side, and the clusters are, ex or the, the vines and clusters are exposed earlier on in the morning. They heat up quickly in the morning, and then they stay warm all day long, and then in the evening there's this low intensity afternoon exposure, which just kind of maintains that, uh, you know, that high level of heat in, in the day. So basically, vines on the west side of the valley the fruit there is staying hot longer during the day than, than uh, on the other side of the valley. And I don't, don't think we'll get to it today, but we do have some other supporting evidence of this, uh, looking at road direction and where the cluster is in the vine and how the, the sun hits that during the day. And there are certainly big temperature differences in those, just, just from road direction alone, let alone the sides of the valley. Okay, so we have some evidence from that, that uh, you know, there's something going on anyways with temperature and light. So another experiment that we started, um, we looked at manipulating the, um, the canopy in order to take a look at um, 
vegetative aromas, but also a number of other things. So we monitor phenolics and, uh, uh, and of course, you know, grape composition and a number of other factors. This, these are fisheye photographs, and they're actually fake. They're just pretty ones that I made for presentations, but um, you'll see real ones in a minute. <laughs> uh, so this is a VSP, and this is a sprawl canopy here. And you can see right off the bat uh, the difference in the amount of sky that can be seen from the VSP. What, what you don't know is the camera is actually right up here in the fruiting zone normally. I took these about a foot and a half below the, the cordon. So normally they're right up in the fruiting zone and it looks much different. In a VSP it almost looks like this. So it's, you know, it's able to, uh, to see how much light penetration gets into the canopy. I'll talk about more about that in a minute. So this experiment we had four treatments. So this is a sprawl. It's actually more, we, we were calling it a loose tuck. Uh, but I just refer to it as a sprawl treatment, but it's not a true sprawl. We just unhook the, uh, the clips every second post, and then we did the opposite posts on the other side of the vine. So it just allowed the canopy kind of to spread out and, uh, and grow more towards the rows. Here we have VSP, so very tight, uh, upright canopy. And then we overlay that with early and late tipping treatments. So, these treatments were early July, late July, and the reason why we were targeting that period is to uh, watch lateral growth. So if you tip too early when the fruit isn't developed far enough along, the fruit isn't uh, a big enough sink to pull the energy from the plant into fruit development. So it'll go back into shoot development, so you get more lateral growth if you tip too early, as opposed to if you tip after that fruit is big enough and is pulling enough energy from the vine, you'll, you'll be able to tip and not have as, as much lateral growth. So the treatment with the most dense canopies out of these four would be this VSP early tipping treatment. And then we sampled at uh, a number of dates throughout maturation here, so pre on post on at commercial maturity and then we wanted to let them hang a little longer to, to see what happens with that. So again, we did a bunch of measurements where we wanted to, to characterize the canopy, the light penetration, the fruiting zone, and then characterize the crop itself. And then we looked at fruit composition and a number of parameters here. So this is an actual fisheye photograph, and uh, we use this to characterize the light uh, composition coming into that fruiting zone. So we actually, it's like pretending the lens of the camera is a cluster, and we take uh, about four photos per vine along the cordon, and what this is doing is it's, uh, we use software to model um, how much sunlight, so direct sun flecking, in, indirect sun flecking, uh, direct light, indirect light, how much open space there is in the canopy. And it will do this for us. So if we take a, a photo, um, this is called a sun map here. So this is where the sun would travel. And this is uh, the highest in the sky. The sun is June 21st and the lowest. And this purple line is the day that we were sampling on for these particular photos. And so what this software will do is it can predict anywhere within this map, uh, you know, for that canopy at that point in time. I mean, of course it changes over time, but you can get some information say through the day or, or over a week where the canopy isn't changing that much about how much light penetration there is into that fruiting zone at any time during the day. So here's just a quick graph of uh, just showing if our treatments are working or not. The, we have the percent open space or the, the amount of direct sun flex on the fruit. And down here we have our treatments. We have uh, percent open space in the blue or whatever that is, or and then the direct sun flex in the purple. And we can see right away that, uh, oh, so these, 
The open space is a visual assessment from the side of the canopy, and the direct sun effect is from the fisheye photographs. So we can see differences between the um, VSP here and the sprawl. And then if we, if we combine the early tipping, there's two for tipping and the two for late tipping, the late tipping, uh, there is more uh, light getting into that fruiting zone and, and more open canopies. So when we looked at the difference between sprawl and BSP for some of the basic composition, there were no differences really between TA, pH, and uh, soluble solids. But when we looked at the tannin content, uh, we found that the C tannin here, so this is C tannin, uh, this is per, by percent dry weight from Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. So the, oh, and we have uh, BSP and sprawl, and then we have uh, the light blue is early tipping and the dark blue is late tipping. And we have higher amounts of C tannin when we have sprawl canopies, and there's no difference between the, the tipping treatments. And we see that with skin tannin as well in the Merlot, uh, but we didn't see that result with the Cabernet Sauvignon. When we looked at pyrazine content, and for those of you that were at the, uh, the fruit and vegetable conference, and sorry for the repeating slides, but uh, we have a few repeats here. Anyways, this is the development over time of isobutyl methoxypyrazine, so this is the vegetative aroma that smells like bell pepper or sometimes has a dusty aroma. And these are the four treatments here. So the most dense treat treatment, which was the early tipping VSP, you can see that uh, down around the harvest date, so that around sort of mid-October uh, is when cab soap is beginning to be harvested down south. And then this is, we let it hang a little bit longer here to the end of October, which is usually about the maximum time we, we let uh, fruit go in the vineyards in the Okanagan. And you can see here uh, quite a difference between that dense treatment and, and the rest of the treatments here. Um, and just a note, the sensory threshold in red wines is about 15 nanogram or nanograms per liter, which is right around here. So you can see that these lower treatments are kind of hovering around that threshold. Now thresholds are quite variable, so you know it could be 10, it could be 20, but it's just a, an idea that uh, you know a little bit of movement in the concentrations of these things can make a really big impact in flavor and aroma in your grapes and wine. And you can, you know, this denser treatment up here is well above what those threshold levels would be. If we look at the same compound, so isobutyl methoxypyrazine in Merlot this time, and over time we can see uh, early tipping versus late tipping. We can see that uh, there was an effect in 2008, and that um, uh, again we're just sitting right around this threshold level here. So. Uh, you know, something as small as uh, one of these canopy manipulations can make a big difference in the end result in terms of vegetative characters. Okay, so this is uh, a project which is ongoing right now, and um, this is uh, through the um, AIP program with Agriculture Canada and the BC Wine Grape Council. We're looking at uh, shoot positioning cluster positioning, leaf removal, and economics of leaf removal. So it's quite a large project, and I'm not gonna present everything here, but uh, what I would like to show you are these, these two goals here of surveying the industry and then also looking at how the timing and severity of leaf removal impacts quality. So the survey, uh, was done in the first year, and we used that to, in order to develop some of our treatments in our experiments. Um, so, before I get into the research, just talk about the what's known about the timing of leaf removal. 
And this is uh, what, what's supposed to happen according to literature. So pre-bloom, uh, we should see reductions in yield, uh, lighter, looser clusters, and smaller berries. Um, there's been reported increases in sugar and phenolics in color, increased, increased quercetin, and lower seed mass and number. Quercetin, I, I want to point that out, is one of the uh, one of the big finds with leaf removal, the amount of quercetin that's produced, and I'll explain that, the reason why that's important in a minute. At fruit set, it's supposed to uh, advance ripening. Uh, it allows acclimation to sun exposure. We've seen this where we can have very intense light or sun in the summer. And if you uh, do leaf removal early enough, we, we think it's the fruit's able to uh, acclimatize to the conditions, but also you get a little bit more uh, lateral growth uh, shading the fruit by the time the intense uh, sun comes in the summer. Um, you can see here, quercetin levels have been reported to increase up to tenfold at fruit set uh, leaf removal. And uh, tannin precursors decrease, reduce uh, incidence of disease, uh, reduce malate, T A potassium, reductions in uh, pyrazines, and increases in aromatics. And then at Verazon, there's not too much known about leaf removal at Verazon, as far as I could tell. Um, depending on when you do this, if you're going, you know, at 35 degrees, uh, stripping the leaves off, and uh, just suddenly exposing that fruit, your chances are you're going to get some sunburn. Um, we did a little, so I'll show you a little bit of work that we've done on this. So let me just back up to the quercetin thing. Um, quercetin is a cofactor in copigmentation, and it's the reason why they would add uh, some white varieties back to red wine because they're high in quercetin levels and that can help with co-pigmentation which is basically stabilizing pigments so that's why it's so interesting that if you can do leaf removal and increase the levels of those say in a red wine uh, you should be able to get much more stable pigments and I'll talk about what we found in our results in terms of course so how much leaf removal do we need to be doing um, how do we do it exactly is it the cooler side of the vine on both sides what about site conditions, um, you know, canopy structure, road direction, when do we do it? Um, it is the reason why we're doing it something that we're actually attaining in the end. And then we, there's a number of concerns, like I mentioned sunburn. Hail damage, if you do leaf removal early on and you get a hail, those leaves aren't there to protect the fruit and you'll get a lot more damage and we've seen that happen in some vineyards. Um, and then the economics of it, is it going to pay off for you? Is, are your input costs going to be recouped by increases in, equal, in quality, uh, pesticide efficiency, disease reduction, and quicker harvesting? So we asked these questions to uh, 53 growers in a survey. And what we found at the time was 51 out of the 53 growers did some form of leaf removal. Um, we ask questions like how, why, when, where, what does it cost, those sorts of things. And then we followed up with a site visit to uh, basically do some ground truthing to see if what they, were, um, what they were saying was accurate in terms of how much they were doing and, and the timing of that. Now, leaf removal is one of those things that is not highest priority at that time of the season. You're concerned about sprays. And, um, thinning and a number of other things so it often gets you know put off a little bit so we just wanted to take a look and see um, when leaf removal was actually being performed and what we found was that uh, most of them are doing leaf removal by hand here uh, about a third of them do it more than once in the season and it, the estimated cost was around $160 an acre. So this here, um, for red and white varieties, so if you look at the reasons for doing leaf removal, and you follow the red down this way, so it's, it doesn't go across, it's just down. 
So for red varieties, about 20% would like to advance ripening, about 43% for wine quality, and about 37% for pest and disease control. And you can see it's spread, you know, fairly similarly with whites. Um, how it's applied, half the people do one side, the other half do two sides for both varieties, or for both red and white. And then the timing, we can see that few people do it around bloom, bloom, pre-bloom. Uh, most people are doing around fruit set, and then about a third are, are around veraison. So really it's, uh, it's all over the place, which isn't a bad thing. It's just that you know, people have different goals in mind for, for why they're doing it. And so really what we want to do is take from this and see if what their expectations, if their expectations were meeting the goal. So we designed uh, a number of experiments. I'm just gonna talk about this one here with Syrah, where we did uh, pre-bloom leaf removal. And this is an experiment that we did with um, Mike Watson at Constellation, and it was in combination with uh, mechanization for pre-bloom leaf removal. So I'm not gonna talk about that either. We'll just talk about the results from, from the uh, manual uh, leaf removal here. So we had four treatments, so control with no defoliation. Um, Mike told me uh, when he first started this, we came in uh, um, partway through the, uh, the season on this experiment and kind of linked in and developed a bit more of an experiment to be able to make wine from it. He said when he removed six leaves, it scared him a lot because it almost defoliated the whole shoot. And so that's why there's the four leaf uh, just to kind of hedge his bets. So I thought that was, that was kind of funny. It turns out the six leaf uh, really does a good job. Um, fruit set leaf removal is the other treatment. And then of course we did a number of vineyard measurements. Uh, so temperature, light, vigor, um, yield components, etc. We did some just some basic wine making and looked at chemistry of, of both fruit and wine, and then we did sensory evaluations on those wines with judges uh, selected from winemakers within the industry. So I hope you can see this. I should have put a sheet behind this, thumb, but you can see how extreme the defoliation is here. Uh, it's taking at least uh, half to maybe even up to two thirds of the leaves off at this stage, which is uh, uh, just pre-bloom. This is what it looks like uh, at fruit set. So you can see, you know, a lot of it's grown in. The fruiting zone is still fairly open down here. This is what 50% leaf removal would look like here, and no leaf removal at all. So the results for yield um, are here, and I just wanted to point out some highlights. So this is the uh, cluster weight here, and we can see, so if you look down right at the very bottom here, this is the two years and the percent difference from, uh, from the control for the six leaf pre-bloom treatment. So you can see in 2012 here, uh, we get some reduction and even more in, uh, in 2013. And number of berries per cluster, we get almost a 50% reduction in number of berries per cluster in 2013. Um, berry weight was reduced as well. So all these things uh, combine together to create a substantial reduction in yield. So, you know, about a, a third reduction in yield in the end. So Sauvignon Blanc, or uh, Syrah in the Okanagan is a, is a crop that they have to um, crop thin quite uh, heavily. So in order to get the yield down. So the, one of the advantages of this was to uh, reduce the cluster size, the, the yield, but also open those clusters up. They're fairly tight clusters. And um, so that it'll reduce labor, you know, on that side in the end, and also hopefully improve quality. So here's some uh, berry composition numbers, and uh, there's nothing super exciting here. Um, we see 
the uh, uh, the pre-bloom treatments have slightly so higher soluble solids, um, lower pHs right here, and the uh, TAs were fairly similar, but it's not much to write home about there. Uh, but the phenolics were interesting. We had uh, quite big differences in phenolics for uh, particularly six leaf pre bloom treatment and in berry color. And this is all in, in berries here. And we can see that follows through for, for each one here. Um, when we look at anthocyanins, so this graph here is actually three groups of anthocyanins right here. So the uh, cinnamoil derivatives, the uh, glucosides with, that are non-acylated and uh, acylated glucosides, you don't need to know that. Just look at this one on the right here. Um, so this is the combination of these three total anthocyanins. And interestingly enough, uh, you know, the pre-bloom treatments, they seem to have higher anthocyanins, but look at the fruit set treatment here, the leaf removal. And it's actually lower than what the control was, which was a bit of a surprise. If we look at phenolics in the wine itself, um, we can see here's that same result reflected in the anthocyanins that we just saw in, in the fruit. And if we look at condensed tannins, uh, we see quite a rise in the six uh, leaf pre bloom and even the four leaf pre bloom treatments in those condensed tannins. So here's uh, quercetin. So one of these compounds that uh, has been reported in the literature to increase substantially with, with uh, fruit set leaf removal. Whoops. Uh, so what they look like, these are the differences. It's just the sugar moieties on the side are a little bit different, but otherwise the base structure is the same among them all. That's the chromatogram where they're located, that's all boring stuff. Okay, so we got uh, the quercetin content with the treatments along the bottom here and the concentration on the side. And this is just the, the two main ones that we found in the grapes. And um, this is milligrams per gram of dry skin and milligrams per kilogram of fruit. So you see they pretty much mirror each other. and. This also was an interesting result where we found, yes, the uh, pre-bloom treatments had quite a bit higher levels of quercetin, but the fruit set treatment, the one that was supposed to have, you know, possibly up to 10 times more, was actually lower than what the control was. And that goes against what's been reported in the literature. Okay, so we have, um, look at the wine now and look at some sensory attributes. So, okay. This isn't showing up. Let me get skip through a little bit. Okay. This is kind of backwards, but the blue are flavor uh, descriptors, and the orange are aroma descriptors. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the PCA chart, these are vectors. So this is a two dimensional representation of. Uh, of um, the aromas and flavors that we found in this wine and this is the control and so how this works is the closer these these uh, dots are to the descriptors uh, the more like those things that they are so for instance these green ones here are close to vegetative aroma vegetative flavor red fruit black pepper uh, these sorts of things that are usually associated with um, uh, maybe less mature fruit. And they're far away from black pepper flavor, black fruit, flavor and aroma, cooked fruit. So these are nice, the nice dark, rich flavors and aromas here. So they're far away from that. So that means they have less of it than something that would be up here. So if we just go through this, here's the four leaf pre bloom. So we're starting to move. Uh, a little bit away from the vegetative, you know, towards this black pepper. Uh, 
here we have the six leaf pre-bloom. So we're getting closer to this cooked fruit uh, side here and more importantly, away from the vegetative uh, aspects. And then up here, our fruit set leaf removal. So this was another surprise. Um, you know, some of those other parameters like the, uh, the phenolics weren't, um, weren't being increased by the treatment, but yet we have some really nice flavors and aromas coming out in the wine. We look at 2015, so the same type of plot. There's the flavors, the aromas. And this one gets a little complicated because we added a few other treatments in here. So this here we have uh, Vraison leaf removal at two levels and fruit set Vraison at two levels. And at the 50% we only did the north side of the vine. So here's the control. So you can see it's around the uh, kind of meaty vegetative side. Uh, we have some cooked fruit flavor there. And here's our fruit set. 50% on the north side. So again, still kind of up in that vegetative area. Here we have, um, this is, oh, did I screw that up? This one here, I guess, fruit set 100%. And we can see it's come right down into this, uh, um, you know, body, black fruit, black pepper, uh, astringency, so more fruity. Serve raise on 50%. And it's really doesn't seem to be doing much good for the wine. It's more, you know, up in this vegetative area away from this black fruit stringency over here. And then we have our raise on 100%. So this is uh, associated more with these really light uh, fruity fla or flavors and aromas like red, red fruit, some much lighter floral. And then we have our six leaf pre-bloom, which again is, um, it's away from the vegetative characters and down in this uh, uh, black fruit, red fruit area. So it looks like um, that pre-bloom treatment also uh, was good for uh, flavor and aroma development. So I haven't talked about Riesling at all, but I thought I would just show you um, some leaf removal trials, the sensory and wine from Riesling. And uh, so this is an experiment where we did 0%, um, 50% at fruit set, both sides of the vine, 50% at, or 100% at fruit set, 50% at Raison, and 100% at Raison. And then we have our descriptors just like before. Uh, except for, for white. And so the reason why I wanted to show you this is because it's a white wine and of course what you're looking for, the attributes you're looking for are much different. And it responds slightly different to leaf removal than what a red variety would. Um, so here's the zero percent and we have, I just wanted to explain here, herbal is not herbaceous, it's different. Um, so we have herbal here and herbal up here. So that's more, um, almost not quite medicinal, but uh, um, well, it's herbal, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, so there's nothing really negative in, in these descriptors at all, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so it's just kind of describing these wines here. So we have our 0%, kind of on the you know, sweet, honey, tropical, uh, with good body. Um, here we have the fruit set, 50%. It's kind of spread all over, but uh, tends towards more of this, um, you know, this herbal acidity over here. We have our fruit set at 100, moving away from this tropical flavor, sweetness, honey, and up into more of the citrus, um, Acid, acidity, herbal, honey aromas over here. And here we have our Vraison, where it's uh, again shifting more towards this herbal, uh, more acidic citrus type flavors and aromas. And then our Vraison at 100%, which is really shifted over. Uh, so more acidic, um, uh, 
perhaps a little less ripe fruit. And here's the 2015, same setup uh, where we have our 0% uh, leaf removal. Here's our 50% at fruit set, and you can see it's down, you know, it's got a good body mouthfeel, uh, but associated more with these herbal flavors and aromas. Uh, here's our 100% fruit set, so big difference from the 50. This is up more on these nice tropical citrus sort of flavors with some acidity. Here's our Verazon at 50, back down towards these uh, herbal aromas, and then our Verazon at 100, which seems to be fall right in the, in the middle there. So the from other studies that we've looked at, white varieties, um, depending on what the variety is, there seems to be differences with leaf removal uh, in terms of uh, what kind of quality you're getting out of it. And an example is Sauvignon Blanc, which we're just uh, in the process of doing some sensory analysis. Um, we've done one year, we're just going to conduct the second year, and we've done a round table on it already. And it appears, um, because you're looking for different things in Sauvignon Blanc, it appears that um, uh, Verazon leaf removal might be helpful for that particular variety. But in Riesling here, it doesn't seem to be um, uh, you know, producing as high quality wines as say a uh, fruit set leaf removal you know, at the 100% level. So the, the jury's still out on this. We still have a bit more sensory to do, but it looks like uh, there might be some slight differences between your approach in terms of red and white wines, uh, or red and white grapes, and then you, how you can do, how you would like to do your leaf removal. So if we go back to these things that are supposed to happen with leaf removal, I just made a little checklist here. So yes, it did reduce uh, yield that pre-bloom. Uh, we didn't find any increases or any differences in sugar, um, but we did in phenolics and color. Uh, there were increases in quercetin at pre-bloom, but we didn't find any differences in the seed mass or seed number. At fruit set, uh, whoops, we didn't find an advanced ripening. Uh, we didn't see any sunburn, so uh, you know that it, it's hard to tell whether uh, there was there was anything there. But um, in our experiments, we didn't see any, and this was located down in Oliver um, area, so you know it's one of the hotter areas in, in the Okanagan. Um, we didn't see this increase in quercetin uh, like we expected, and we didn't see any decrease in tannin precursors. Uh, we didn't have, we don't have much disease, and uh, the, we didn't see any differences in, in disease levels between the treatments. We did see reduction in malate, TA, potassium, reduced IBMP, and increases in some aromatics. At Verazon, um, again, the jury's kind of out on, on uh, what's happening with it. some of the aroma compounds. We don't see reductions in vegetative aromas, but some of the other more positive aromas, um, it seems to be variety dependent at, at this point. And again, risk of sunburn, um, we've seen it both ways and it just seems to depend on the timing when you do it. If you pull leaves off midday and a hot day, you know, as opposed to, uh, on a cooler day where it at least has a bit of time to activate, you're, you're uh, probably better off. So that's all I have. Um, this is the team that I work with. And uh, so we worked for years together. Uh, Jose is the latest to the team here. He's a plant pathologist and works along with Dan O'Gorman. Tom Lowry, our entomologist. So he's the one who really uh, uh, we work with to start off this leaf removal stuff about 15 years ago. And then there's Pat Bowen, plant physiology, and Carl Bogdanoff. Then I've listed a few people down here, so you might know Margaret Cliff, who's been uh, instrumental in our sensory evaluations, and, um, and some other people that we work with here, Scott Smith, Tom Forge, and Joan Constant. And 
right, so that's all I have. I just want to thank the BC Wine Grape Council, of course, and, the, and Agriculture Canada for funding. And we do all our work in wineries and vineyards within the industry. So I really want to thank them because they contribute a lot of time, effort, fruit, and uh, consultation. I mean, we, we talk back and forth with them a lot, and uh, it's extremely valuable to help us uh, direct and, and guide research. And then these are my technicians at the bottom who, of course, have done the lion's share of all this work. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was a great talk. And uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions out there from the audience here, as well as anyone who's viewing online. So with that, I'll open up the floor for, for questions from the audience. Um, the, it was interesting looking at your 100% Beresol. Um, what is it that you know we're working on with different timings that are except for this one, 50% but um, we, in the wines, in the juice, we found lots more colour at 100% Reposol. But after wine making, that colour dropped out. Like it, it ended up much lighter than the other ones. Um, so that's something that has been, hopefully it will happen again this year. But it's a particularly interesting aspect that, yeah, it gives loads of colour at 100% Reposol, but it does, it's not stable colour. It doesn't hold that colour. Um, and certainly, but I don't know about the arranging. Did you have a look at colour? I saw you did some other science, but I wondered whether you did anything else on. Um, yes, we we did. I don't have the answer off the top of my head, but it would be really interesting to look at things like quercetin and, and that yeah. that might stabilize that. So if the levels of those are very low, uh, you know, maybe there's nothing there to kind of hold it in place. Yeah. Um, we can uh, we certainly do look at all sorts of phenolics in a general way. And then we focus in with uh, HPLC with, for some of the specific targets like the anthocyanins or, or quercetin. So I'm sure we do have those numbers, and uh, um, but I didn't, you know, I didn't present a lot of that stuff just because the big amount. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Um, you were talking earlier, earlier on at the beginning about the C13 compounds, yes. and um, Damascino is really well known. Yeah. And I think most people would know that by now. But I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the other two compounds. Um, well, we actually looked at 15 different noroisoprenoids, and uh, we were really lucky. We had a fellow by the name of Nigel Eggers, who was a collaborator on the project along with. Uh, um, you know, Benoit Gerard and Pat Bowen. And um, he, he was a chemist and he synthesized standards for us. So we were able to uh, do a really good job of characterizing those, which is, uh, there's not many labs that, that have had that uh, ability. Yeah, they are really unusual. Yeah, so some of them are um, precursors and are important within the, uh, the pathways for developing some of those compounds. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of them in there that are really like directly important to flavor or indirectly because they're a precursor to those. So things like um, uh, ionone is important, for instance, and those are some of the more common ones. Yeah. The ones that I presented, uh, they all have flavor and aroma associated with them, and. Um, I can actually send you a list of those if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Any other questions? Emily? So it seemed like your 50% removal trials across the board didn't really do that much. Would you say it's uneconomical to, if you're going to spend the money and go on a leaf mode to just do one side of the line? Um, I don't know if we have enough evidence yet. I'd kind of hesitate to say that right off the bat because there's other benefits, uh, certainly other benefits that besides the chemistry. So, you know, uh, things like easier harvesting or spray penetration, disease, you know, helping with disease, those sorts of things, which is, you know, as, imp as important as, as quality. Um, but you're right, it's uh, it almost seems like it's a gradient. So 100% does a really good job. 50% does a mediocre job, and 
you know, and zero doesn't do much for some of the aspects that I was showing. Um, and then, you know, like the, it was a surprise with the time or with the uh, some of the fruit set measurements on, you know, say the quercetin that really didn't do anything at all, which it totally poses what's in the literature. And that's, but that's just Syrah, maybe it's an oddball, I don't know, because they didn't do that work in Syrah. Um, Andrea? Um, I was just like curious in all the, the PC that you were showing at the different relevant trials and like the sensory evaluation, mm -hmm. like you seem to show four replicates mm -hmm. of, for each of them. And I was wondering if you ever do like a difference test within each replicate before you submit that to your panel. Like I was surprised to see sometimes the differences are, are really big and sometimes in our white making trials, we do different tests like to see if the reps are different from each other and often we don't find that much difference. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So I was wondering how like, it went for you. Yeah, we do, um, and so we do a pre-screening where we look at uh, if there are any wine differences. We want to include everything that we can, mm -hmm. even if they are different. So we don't want to select for you know something if, unless it's a winemaking fault. Uh, if it's something we feel is coming from the field, mm -hmm. then we would like to include that in. And then we so we'll we'll do the different testing and also assemble a lexicon of descriptors. So we uh, predetermine what those will be. And then the, the people that are doing that don't do the tasting generally. So then we bring in winemakers. Um, and we, we like to use winemakers because uh, they're very experienced with wine, obviously. But the wines that we make, we don't, we don't really do many additions, if any. So they're very raw. They're not you know, table wines. And uh, so they're able to evaluate the, you know, wines that are in that state very well. And so, um, yeah, it's, sensory is difficult. <laughs> and, it, and our experience is you, you do get some variability, especially if the wines are very similar. So the more similar the wines are, the more variability you get in the sensory analysis, it seems, because they all, I mean, be similar between treatments, not within the treatment. Any other questions? Any questions from the online audience? No? Andy, any questions? Okay, with that, thank you very much, Kevin. That was a great talk. It was like, really interesting to hear what's going on in the West Coast. And there's a lot of information there, and you only presented a little tidbit, I'm yeah. sure. So thank you again. And uh, thanks for everyone for joining us today. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, we'll welcome uh, Dr. Wendy McFadden-Smith from uh, OMAFRA. And uh, her talk next week will be on sour rotted grapes, managing your pre-harvest breakdown. So please join us next week and have a good weekend, everyone.